Hey, Matt, such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for joining at the podcast Dykes Monks Drive. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been great getting to know you, and I look forward to recording this. Always a pleasure speaking to you. Always. All these interactions that we've had in the last few months' time, I think they have been extremely fruitful, extremely interesting, extremely thought-provoking, intriguing. Hmm. All these conversations have left me with something to ponder on. Hmm. And I'm sure this conversation is going to be very similar. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. No, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. So Matt, let's take a deeper dive in the life of Matt. One of those episodes of your life from your childhood that brings a smile on your face today as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I am a programmer, but I'm not just a programmer. I'm a third generation programmer, which means my dad was a programmer and his dad was a programmer. So my grandfather was sort of among some of the first. When I grew up, you know, like in the 80s, when I first started messing around with computers, uh, it was already personal computers. But um, I had this connection to my grandfather who could tell me stories of what it was like when he started working on computers, when they took up entire rooms, when programming a computer was a monumental sort of undertaking that it's hard for me to have even perspective on. He, you know, when he started doing programming, they would put together programs on things called punch cards and each punch card would be the next sort of low level machine instruction punched in a certain way. And so you could have hundreds or even thousands of punch cards that together made up a program. And he kept a lot of those, even though that's not how by the eighties he was programming anymore. He kept a lot of those programs just because they meant a lot to him and he was able to take them with him. Uh, and he would show them to me and he would show all kinds of funny things about them and tell me stories about dropping them on the way to the operator. You know, like they would have to carry all their punch cards with them to an operator to be run overnight and come back the next day and try to find out what happened. And sometimes they wouldn't even make it there. They would accidentally drop them on the way and spill all their punch cards and spend hours getting them back in the right order. Sometimes they would take their um, programs to the operator and you know, leave them with the operator and then come back the next day, the program ran overnight and the program didn't work. And that was literally the result that all the operator could tell them, your program mm. doesn't work. And they yeah. have hundreds of punch cards to go through. I got a lot of stories like that growing up, which still mean a lot to me to this day to be part of this sort of connected to this sort of tradition, I guess you could say, in this, this sort of transformation that's gone and on in the world uh, to have a connection to it it's mm. meaningful to me so you were born in that context you were born in that environment where people were talking about computers computers and computers yeah yeah absolutely mm. yeah since i since i was little i've been into it playing with computers mm -hmm. playing with them eventually programming them mm. um you know i think one thing i want to add here too is that talking to my dad and my grandfather growing up about software development, they told me all the good things. They didn't tell me the bad things. I didn't, I didn't really have, I had a lot of starry eyed ideals about what it would be like to be a software developer when I grew up. Um, and the reality didn't match those ideals. Um, I think we inherit a lot from our parents a lot more than we realize we don't just inherit the good right we also inherit the suffering um and that was something that was shocking to me i knew growing up that my dad for instance suffered from panic attacks that he would get them at work he would tell me about them but i never connected it like why would this be happening to him Right. And it wasn't until I got my first internship in software development and mm -hmm. I saw how miserable people could be doing something that up to that point, I thought was the most amazing thing in the world, the most fun thing in the world, something I couldn't imagine people would pay me to do to program computers and then to discover 
it can actually be a terrible experience, a high mm-hmm. stress experience, an experience in which people took all of the creativity out of it, all of the joy out of it, and replaced it with a pressure cooker that just beat people down. And then I began to understand why my dad suffered the way he did. Mm-hmm. No, help me um, understand. In my mind, I've not been able to find the connection here. So on one hand, what I'm listening is that you are born into a context where your father, your grandfather used to talk about programming. Mm-hmm. And when you got into programming, you realize how stressful, a miserable a job it is to be a programmer. Now, mm-hmm. is it the programming which is stressful or the environment that you're working in that makes it stressful? No, definitely the environment. Programming itself can be a pure joy, right? It's mm-hmm. the magic of creation of staring in a blank canvas and filling it, filling, filling it up with code to mm. get a machine to do things it couldn't do before. That's a beautiful, fun process. Mm. And you can do that with other people and still have all that fun. But what I discovered in my first 10 years or so in industry that whether I was working at a startup or at an enterprise or at a, in the IT organization of a hospital, uh, or a large financial company, like no matter where I went, somehow they, it's like people had gotten together and thought, how could we make this terrible? How could we make people miserable while doing something that they love until mm. they don't love it anymore? Until mm. they just want to go home and not look at a computer again, right? Mm. That's how I eventually began to feel. Um, and and I, I very much considered quitting like the industry. Mm thought about doing it. And I was very lucky to get an email from uh, a company um, while I was working at a very large enterprise that said, hey, we saw some of your open source work. We think you could be a fit here. Would you come and interview with us? And up until that moment, I had really thought, I'd sort of written off the industry and thought maybe I won't be doing this in another couple of years. And then I took that interview. It was with a company, a little company called Pivotal Labs. They did extreme programming, uh, which is a way of doing software development that's focused on rapid iteration, uh, rapid iteration, uh, massive collaboration, um, uh, lots of learning, and things like pair programming. Lots of really radical ideas. But to the experience of even just interviewing at this company, I instantly realized like this isn't a lost cause. There is something good that can still happen in the world of software development. And not only is it going to be good for me, it's going to be good for the products that we build, for the users that use those products, for the companies that make money off those products. We're going to do great things and it's going to have synergy in the original sense of the word. Like it's going to actually be a benefit all around. Mm -hmm. Um, And I took that job and spent the next 10 years there and changed my life and my belief about what's possible in the world. You know, before I even talk about what happened from that point onwards, I would love to hear, you know, what you're talking about, I could relate to that because I'm a computer engineer and very early I realized that's not I would like to do in my life. That's not the kind of life that I would like to create for myself. At the same time, Matt, I come across so many engineers. They will tell you that how the life is so miserable and it's so full of stress, and yet they continue to work in the same organization, they continue to work in the same environment under more or less the similar bosses. Just curious, Mm -hmm. what made them stay where they are and continue to make their life miserable? Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I'd I'd like to say two things here. Um, Mm -hmm. One, having been in a similar situation in which I felt stuck, Like I wasn't happy, but I didn't feel safe to move. Um, I can I can certainly empathize with the experience you're talking about. Mm. I think we also had to recognize that today, in the midst of things like the Great Resignation, something is fundamentally changing about this dynamic. Mm. For me personally, when I felt like I've been stuck, uh, when I'm miserable and yet I can't somehow make the move, it's been a combination of a fear of change, a fear of failure. And also, um, in, when I felt especially stuck, I was living in a place and in a city and in a family situation in which 
even if I was making good money as a programmer, it was still never enough, right? We, it was still, you know, like if, if we just miss one or two paychecks, we're going to miss rent, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to get kicked out. What's going to happen to us, right? Somehow it's easy to get, like when I used to live in a New York City, and it, it's easy to live in a place like that and make lots of money and still be right on the edge of disaster, financial disaster. Um, not even doing anything that's, you know, somehow irresponsible, being responsible and yet still living on the edge of disaster. Mm. That's a scary place to be. And it can cause you to fear making any changes. It is. It is fear of failure, fear of change and the financial disaster that you are anticipating in your mind. Mm hmm. How did you manage to move out of that when you were talking about that it's a miserable space to be living at the edge? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, so while I was in New York City is when I got that email and when I made the switch to Pivotal Labs and when I began to work for somewhere that renewed my hope in both the field of software development and in work in general, right? Because I became immersed in a radically collaborative environment in which I was paid all day to learn and geek out with fellow software engineers, writing amazing code, building amazing products, iterating and learning and putting software in the hands of users, right? That was a wonderful experience. And over time, I played a number of roles within that organization and eventually a role of global head of engineering, which meant that I didn't have to live in a specific city anymore because... I was working with people all over the globe at that point, right? We had 22 offices around the world by that point. Mm. Uh, And at that point, my wife was also, uh, she had finished her graduate school work. She was in industry and she was in a position that was global as well. And so we said, we have three kids now. We cannot live in New York anymore. Let's get out. And we made that move and we got out of the city and now we live Mm. in the country. You know, interestingly, Matt, for you, the situations worked out. Everything started yeah. to fall in place. What about people where the situations might not be favoring them? Yeah. How no. can they move yeah. out of that? What kind of shift in the mindset required to make that move? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So here's where I think it ties into the great resignation. Many, many people in a situation that I was used to be in, in which you felt stuck living in a very expensive city because you had to go into an office in that city, right? Were suddenly in a situation during the pandemic in which they no longer had to go into the office and when and in which they discovered they and the people they worked with could still do amazing things, even though they weren't physically co-located, right? That they could be asynchronous, they could be distributed, and they could still build kick-ass software, Right. That realization, right, I think led to a significant mindset shift on a population level, right? Now you have millions of people who have quit their job instead of going back to the office as the pandemic has wound down and said, you know what, I had a better life and you're not going to force me back into the old way of doing it anymore because I know something Mm -hmm. better is possible and I'm motivated to find it. And by the way, software engineers right now have never had it better from a a supply demand standpoint, right? So all these things are really coming together where the fear of change is probably lessened because of economic circumstances uh, and the mindset change has been brought about through unfortunate circumstances, obviously, like nobody wanted to go through a pandemic, but if there is a silver lining, it is the awareness that something better is possible and that you deserve it. Thank you, Matt, for sharing this. You know, Matt, in all my conversations with you, I found you so grounded. There's something so magical and mystical in your voice. And above above that, you came up with this book called A Radical Enterprise. What led you to write this book? So it's a lot of what I've been talking about, this experience of, you know, having terrible experiences in the software industry and then turning that around to having great experiences in the software industry to beginning Mm -hmm. over time to ask myself, why is it great? What makes this work? Mm -hmm. Who else does this? Is it just software? Is it other industries around the globe? Right. And what forms does it actually take? 
Mm -hmm. right? I begin to ask myself all those kinds of questions and then begin to slowly start poking around, reading mm -hmm. up on the literature, right? Finding people in other companies, right? Eventually interviewing people in other companies, mm -hmm. looking at how they worked. And all that sort of coalesced with the realization that not only did it work for me and it mm -hmm. worked at the company that I was at, it's mm -hmm. working all over the world. And it's, it's not just a few companies here and there. Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 to 15 years, radically collaborative companies have grown from one to three to 8% of corporations around the world. Mm -hmm. And these, these companies, uh, the empirical studies that are coming out about them now uh, by organizational scientists are discovering that these attributes that I talked about from an experiential standpoint of why it feels so good strongly correlate to financial outcomes, right? That are, mm. that, that are, that, that they're out competing their traditional hierarchical bureaucratic competitors, right? A lot of 20th century psychologists like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers and others, they sort of hypothesize that what is good for people would also be good for an organization. That if you mm. created environments in which people had the security, autonomy, fairness, esteem, trust, love, belongingness that they needed from the environment, that it would also create amazing results for the organization. Mm. That was a hypothesis back in 1950. Mm. They didn't mm. know if it was true, but now we know it's very true. These two things are strongly correlated. So mm. all of that sort of coalescing for me in my mind and in the research I was doing convinced me that this is a story that needs to be told more and more, that more and more people need to understand it, understand what's possible, understand what's already happening around the world. Mm. It's sort of this quiet revolution that's going on in ways of working. Mm. Um, mm. And the faster people begin aware of it, the faster this revolution will continue. And, uh, and because it is so meaningful to so many people, right? Mm. It has such a meaningful mm. impact on human lives. I felt compelled to tell the story in my own words. Mm. You know, I've heard about radical acceptance. I've heard about radical compassion. How do you define radical collaboration the way you have defined it in this book? Yeah, okay, great question. Radical, all right. So the companies I'm describing actually have many terms in the literature. So mm. if you've heard of self-governing organizations, if you've heard of holocratic organizations or sociocratic organizations, if you've heard of... Um, self-managing organizations, all of these different terms are used to describe what I call radically collaborative organizations, God. which also isn't a term I made up. It's also another term you can find out in the literature. All of these are sort of synonymous with organizations that have fundamentally restructured the way they work on a paradigm of partnership and mm. equality, as opposed to a paradigm of domination and coercion, which is mm. the paradigm of industrial revolution and 20th century manufacturing, right? It is a, a fundamental paradigmatic break from that way of working towards partnership and equality. Mm -hmm. Now, radical collaboration itself, why did I choose that term among all the different terms you can find in the literature? Mm -hmm. It's because that speaks to the experience of it. If mm -hmm. you have spent your entire career working in hierarchical bureaucratic organizations um, that have coercive elements to it in the way that you are managed and the way that you are structured and the way you're forced to work with others and the way you have to take orders and the way you have to ask um, permission for everything. If that's been your like experience moving into one of these companies, mm. it is radical. Radical, the meaning of radical, right? The, the Latin root of it is radix, right? Which means root or ground or foundation. Is it about oh. something fundamentally at base shifting? And mm. that's what it feels like. It is a fundamental shift and in a really positive sense, right? Like as mm. a human, you feel like you are suddenly walking on a ground made for humans, not mm. for machines, which can feel like how you are treated in overly hierarchical and bureaucratic organizations. Like you're just some kind of cog in some vast machine. These organizations, everyone feels like a human being day in, day out. And they mm. feel safe mm. to be a human and all that entails, right? Mm. And all its beautiful messiness that it entails. Mm. That's why I chose the term radical collaboration. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, the canvas that you have presented right now, Matt, I can go in all directions. You chose the word 
partnerships, you chose the word uh, collaboration. You chose the word love, care, compassion. Let's pick up this one small piece on the canvas. You know, when we're talking about partnerships and collaborations, not all the people are operating from that space. You might be operating from a space of partnership. You might be operating from a space of collaboration. The other person might be extremely confrontational or assertive. Just wondering, people who are operating from this space of love and care and partnership and collaboration, how easy or difficult is it for them to be assertive in this kind of an environment where the other person is too confrontational? Yeah, this um, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I uh, have struggled in my life with mm. agreeableness, mm. right? Well, so there's there's sort of nowadays in, in the field of psychology, they sort of look at five personality traits and the combination of these traits. And that's mm. how they can sort of think about and conceptualize different neuropathologies um, uh, and mental illness and all that, and also mental well-being at the same time. Mm. One of those dimensions is agreeableness. Mm. Um, and the thing is, when people are overly agreeable, those people, their experience, uh, and someone who is overly agreeable is strongly correlated with an experience of resentment, right? So if you are always trying to make sure that the other people around you are happy, internally, you end up discovering that you resent everyone around you at the same time, right? That you angry at people, you yeah. probably keep it bottled up, right? And so for me, that was an experience that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something I set out to work on uh, about, uh, really intentionally to work on about three years ago with my therapist. Mm. It's something I'd tried to work on my own um, and then began to work on with a therapist over time. This is like you end up saying yes to everyone, right? So rather than operating from a space of service, you start to sacrifice a lot in your life. And of course, I can relate to that when you're talking about it will get bottled up and what is left behind is the residual is of resentment for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's a great point. If you are always saying yes to everyone around you, you end up not only hurting yourself, you end up hurting everyone around you too. Mm. You can't actually satisfy everyone around you, right? Mm. You don't have enough time, skill, right? Resources, energy, et cetera, to do that. You have mm. to actually prioritize. You have to know what it is it is important mm. for you to achieve. And you have to prioritize and say yes or no based on that, right? And mm. that is actually your responsibility inside any organization, mm. especially in a radically collaborative organization, right? Radical collaboration doesn't mean doing whatever everybody wants, right? It means actually compassionately yet ruthlessly prioritizing, right? Based on an understanding of what it is you are trying to achieve in your role, your team is trying to achieve in its work, your organization is trying to achieve as a whole, right? So yeah, absolutely. You you can't, if you are overly agreeable, it helps no one and ends up hurting everyone. You spoke about that it's not important. You cannot survive if you end up saying yes. Let me just take you one step backwards. When you said that you have experienced being overly agreeable, what do you think? What's the mindset that one operates from when mm. he or she ends up saying yes? What was the mindset that you were operating from? What was that need to say yes to? Yeah, I mean, certainly I didn't know at first, right? Mm. Why was I even like this? In fact, I didn't even know I was like this at first, right? It, a journey mm. of self-awareness is a, is a funny thing, right? You become aware of who you are, and then you become of, aware of why you are who you are. Right. And that's a whole process. Mm. Yeah. And I discovered that um, a lot of my own uh, personality of being overly agreeable was related to experiences that I had in childhood in mm. which I became convinced that uh, I, I could or could not um, basically get the love that I needed from my parents around me, mm. you know, based on my own actions. Like if I did mm. the right things, they'll love me. 
if I disappoint them, they won't, right? And it's so easy for parents to do that without even trying to do that, right? And, um, and I came away with that belief as a child, right? And it led me to begin to feel like I was responsible for uh, the emotions of everyone around me, that I had to manage their emotions, mm. right? If they were upset, that it was my fault, that if, if they were upset at me, they didn't love me and that was also my fault, mm. right? Like it, it was some very sort of things that happened in childhood that led me to feel like I have to work very hard in my life to keep everyone around me happy. And if they're not, it's my fault mm. and I'm a failure because of it. So that yeah. is, I think, part of why uh, mm. I developed, and I think why many people develop mm. over agreeableness, mm. and why something like radical collaboration can be hard at first, because radical collaboration, one of the four imperatives of radical collaboration that I talk about in the book is candid vulnerability, mm. which is an experience of being, being frank about what you think, but also mm. being vulnerable about why you think it. I said, where is it coming from? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, as I'm just listening to you, Matt, I'm saying, I believe it's too heavy a load to carry that I am responsible for the other person's emotions. Yeah. And an assumption is that I would continue to live a life where I'm always looking for an acknowledgement from others. First, it was my parents. And then I will continue to look at look for acknowledgement from my schoolmates, then college mates, and then people at my workplace. Yeah, yeah. In this carry, what all did you lose for yourself? What was mm. the cost that you end up paying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, there is, well, it, it can be hard to put this in the words, but there is sort of the, the loss of a genuine experience of life, right? Mm. If you are walking around with anger and resentment bottled up inside of you, right? And a, and a misunderstanding about, uh, and a misattribution of other people's feelings and stuff like that, mm. your experience of life, right? Is diminished, right? The full sort mm. of beauty and sort of messy experience of life is lost to you, right? Because you can't, you don't have the courage to actually say what you think and why you think it, right? Mm. And, and in, of course, in the same way that I talked about in a company, this can hurt everyone. It hurts everyone mm. in your relationships too, right? Mm. It doesn't help when you keep everything bottled up inside. It doesn't actually help the people around you, right? Mm. You have to be able to be candid and vulnerable. Uh, mm. So I think that's part of what I lost. It's a it's a terrible experience living in anger, right? Um, the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh described it as a genuine experience of hell, right? Hell is living in anger. And that resonates for me. It rings so true for me based on my own experiences. Mm. Two questions. One is in this entire journey where you are, striving really hard to take care of the other people's emotions. What about your emotions? What's yeah. happening to them? Where are yeah, they getting totally. lost? Yeah. Well, if you believe you're responsible for other people's emotions, the funny thing is you also tend to believe other people are responsible for your emotions, right? Like, oh, if I'm so, angry, it's so, their fault. Yeah, so that means uh, on one hand, I am giving, 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 because I feel I'm responsible for their emotions. On the other hand, there are huge expectations that I have from people. So yeah. anyone can trigger me and I can feel sad. I can feel bad. I can feel hurt. I can feel being a victim. Yeah, being a victim. And it, it you know, and feeling the anger and feeling the resentment. It's a, it's, um, it's a vicious sort of trap, honestly, mm -hmm. that sort of underlying belief system about where emotions come from and what you need from others and what you're getting mm -hmm. from others. It's a bad spiral and, um, and it can lead to very dark places for people. So being able to step out of that 
right? To take responsibility first and foremost for how you feel, right? And not blaming it on everyone around you. That is the first step in my own experience and in my work with my therapist. That is the very first step that I have to take, right? Mm -hmm. And I developed some techniques for doing this. Um, If I am suffering from an angry thought that won't stop in my head, one thing that I have found very effective is to imagine a small version of myself in my head saying that thing. And then for me to walk up to that small version of myself and tell that version, it's okay to give that version of myself a hug, right? To accept that these emotions are real and that they happen, but to also um, take responsibility for them and recognize that that's not anybody else doing it to me. It's me, Mm. right? And the same can be true for all the other sort of negatively valenced emotions that I feel. That technique has helped me take responsibility for how I feel, which is, in my own experience, my first real authentic steps towards radical collaboration and more specifically, candid vulnerability. Because once I'm able to do that, right, my ability to be frank with others, to be open with others, to be transparent with others, to be vulnerable with others, is circumscribed entirely by my own ability to take responsibility for my own emotions. Mm. You know, Matt, I hear you. I hear you 200%. Since you have walked that path, and thus it's comparatively easier for you to say that, hey, I can recognize my emotion and I'm responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how easy or difficult would that be for that person who is in in that deep shit of resentment and anger where he's not been able to see that emotion. Mm-hmm. He's not been able to, or she's not been able to recognize that emotion. How would that person come out of that bin? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very tricky because no one can do it for them. As much as we want to be able to save other people who are in very bad places and hard places, right? You can't force somebody to change. You can't force somebody to think differently and feel better. Mm. That first step really does have to start with them. That doesn't mean we can't create supportive environments around people that give them every chance and every hope and opportunity. But the first critical step really does have to start with them. And it can simply be the step of recognition, right? Mm. That first tiny spark of awareness around what is actually happening, right? That begins to fundamentally flip the narrative inside your mind about what you're experiencing and why you're experiencing it. Yeah, yeah. So in that situation, it's not that they are hurting themselves, they are hurting people around them as well. And as you mentioned, for you, it began from the very early age of your development. Hmm. And that's the reason in case we don't heal ourselves, we'll end up hurting those who did not even hurt us. Absolutely, yeah, Hmm. yeah. How did you manage to come out of that? I mean, I I hear you. You said, start noticing yourself, that small drop of awareness. How was your journey? Very curious to know, Matt. Yeah. Well, this actually began, um, my journey really around this began really very shortly after the birth of my first child, our first daughter. Um, We were still living in New York at the time. And I was, so my wife was on maternity leave. My wife and the baby, every morning when I got up to go to work, were both asleep. And they would sleep like that until maybe 10 a.m. every day. And I would get up and go to work. And I became seized by a fear that after I had left the home, I would be struck with this fear that maybe I didn't lock the doors And therefore, maybe something very bad will happen. Some bad person will get in. And I couldn't get that thought out of my brain. And so I wouldn't be able to make it all the way to work. I'd have to come home. I'd have to come home and check the locks. And I wouldn't just do that. At first, I just would come home once and check them. And then I'd be able to get to work. And then I'd have to come home twice to check them. Three times to check them. Pretty soon, I wasn't able to get to work. Right? I was so struck by this fear. 
And I told my wife, something's wrong. I'm not quite right. I don't know what it is. She helped me. She found uh, a therapy practice very close to us that did cognitive behavioral therapy. And they diagnosed me with an obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, And I recognized that like my father and like his father, I had suffered from anxiety for a long time, had never done anything about it until it eventually spiraled out of control. That was my first sort of awareness of my own experience. Before that, I never thought about my own experience and consciousness Mm. and what I was going through. And that was my first steps towards awareness and that that spark. Um, And over time, that led me on a journey both uh, with therapists and without therapists through self-exploration, both through psychological literature, uh, through spiritual literature, through meditation literature, um, uh, to begin to understand what's really going on in my experiences and in my mind Mm. and what's possible, what it, what it is now, but what it could be. And, and that being said, I will say that over many, many years now, for the last decade plus, actually 12 years that, that I've been on this journey, I have done and tried many things and I have made many, many gains. And, and I think many ways sort of fundamentally change that underlying experience. And yet there is no secret silver bullet to anything that I did that I can point to to say that, that's the thing and everyone should do that. It was such a trial and error journey. And some days I would just wake up and realize Mm. something is different. Often something is gone. Some terrible thing that I used to be stuck with in my mind. Mm. It's just not there anymore. And I couldn't always put my finger on why. But Mm. nonetheless, I've kept this journey up over time Mm. uh, and feel much better about the place I'm in today. Mm. You know, what I'm listening is it, it begins with noticing your own patterns. And if you notice something is not working, it's time to revisit, question yourself, hey, where is it coming from and what's not working? You know, here's another spin to this entire conversation. I have personally come across a lot of people where there's a dire need to look for acknowledgement from others. Mm. They have this complying behavior. They're looking forward to fit into a particular sector of team members that they've been working with. There's a need to please others so that they can get an acknowledgement. You know, Mm -hmm. my assumption is that something which is working by staying in this behavior the way they have stayed for the longest period of time. So there's some kind of results that they are getting. Yeah. So when you're moving to the other end of the continuum, where Mm -hmm. you are trying to be assertive, Mm -hmm. from being compliant to being assertive, how do you manage that fear that in case I let go of this, I might not be able to create the results that I have created in the past. Yeah. It's like a catch-22 situation, right? How did you manage to deal with that fear? Yeah. So our ability to take a risk, like speaking out, saying things, even though you know others might disagree or even get upset about, is to a large extent um, possible based on the amount of psychological success we experience in doing it, right? And so if you had experiences early on in your life in which doing those sorts of things did not result in psychological success, right? Because you were just a child, right? You were just a kid. You didn't know any better. Then you will really struggle as an adult. You really do need support from others. Could be professionals, could be therapists, could be friends, could be family. Uh, you know, it, it could be um, uh, religious, um, you know, your priest or your Zen master, whoever you look to for guidance, right? But you do need some kind of support because what you discover, I think, as an adult, once you are able to take these first steps towards candor and towards vulnerability, that in the adult world, It is not nearly as scary as you thought it was going to be. And that Mm. actually, not only is it not scary, 
oftentimes it does lead to amazing things. It, right? it could be liberating for you because a lot of load that you've been holding on to for so many years, something that you've been trying to protect, somebody that you've been trying to guard for so many years, suddenly you realize that in just one tap that got released and that there's a new realm of possibilities that might be waiting for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that is my own experience of doing this. There are all the time now where I can recognize that in the moment, there is something that either I want to say or something that the participants in the, in the situation are thinking, but probably not saying. Mm. And that if somebody had the courage to talk about it, this interaction would be fundamentally changed by it, that we would actually be able to move forward. It's like mm. sort of like seeing that something has been dammed up, right? And everyone's just walking around it. And no one wants to touch the dam. Everyone wants to pretend it's not even there. And so all you have is this little trickle, right? That's coming out of the dam. You had to break that dam down. And it takes courage to do it. But often it is fundamentally transformative in small mm. and sometimes big ways, right? But it can really fundamentally change the dynamics of a relationship, of a conversation, mm of a meeting, right, of a collaboration. And the more and more we are capable of doing it and taking that risk, the more and more we discover that doing so was successful, which gives us more energy the next time. Matt, you do a lot of work with different organizations. You have worked with organizations in the past as well. How does this behavior of complying and saying yes or uh, being a yes boss kind of a person or looking for an acknowledgement show up in an organization structure? Yeah. When people inside an organization can't say no, dysfunction is sure to follow. You are going to end up with managers or leaders who are fundamentally ineffective at supporting their teams, at supporting the business, at supporting stakeholders, et cetera, because they can't actually prioritize their time, right? And their work, which means that the important things don't happen, right? And, and instead you get stuck in all the minutia of stuff that at the end of the day actually didn't matter as much, right? And in fact, focusing on the stuff that doesn't matter hurts everyone. Dysfunction is the result of over agreeableness, wanting to please everyone, right? And I don't, I don't want to have this, I don't want people listening to this to think that there is something wrong with you if you want to feel recognition from others. There's nothing wrong with you if you want to be recognized by others. It is a fundamental human need. We mm. all are born with the need. It's called the esteem need in the field of psychology. We yeah. need to feel self-esteem. We need to feel esteem from others. We need to be held in high regard, right? Mm. And so there's nothing wrong with you for needing that. But if the need becomes pathological, right? If it becomes something that could never be satisfied, right? You end up creating pain for you and for others and for the organization as a whole. Yeah. You know, um, thank you for bringing that. Where is this need coming from? Is it coming from a space of fear or is it coming from a space of expression? Because expression is one of the basic desires of human soul. And when, you're, when you are expressing from your superpowers, when you're expressing from your gifts and talent that you have been blessed with, mm. you connect with others really well. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be getting into transactions because in that transaction, I'm looking forward to an acknowledgement from you. Mm hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, totally. You're right. It becomes you, you only see people in as much as, as things that are useful or not to you. Right. Mm -hmm. That is the fundamental nature of what in psychology is referred to as deficiency motivation. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're deficiency motivated, you are looking around in your psychological environment, meaning the people around you, the inner subjective environment around you, you are looking around and asking yourselves, does this person or do they not satisfy one of my fundamental needs? And again, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with it, right? Yeah. We do need to create environments in which we feel safe, secure, autonomous, in mm -hmm. which 
the environment is fundamentally structured to be fair for yeah. people to feel like they have the esteem they need, the respect they need, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is not the end, right? Mm. Creating an environment that does that is just the beginning because that unlocks all new possibilities for people, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. the other thing that is true is when you get all of these security, fairness, autonomy, esteem, trust, belongingness that you need to feel like a good human being, you stop needing those things. You exactly. stop looking around you to say, can you give me this? Can you give me this? What are you giving me? What are you taking from me? You yeah. start to fundamentally think differently. And that yeah. unlocks whole new levels of potential for yourself, for the people around you, and for your organization. Thank you so much, Matt. I mean, thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with you. As I've told you, all my conversations with you have left me with deep reflective questions to ponder on. And as you said, that it's okay to walk the path of safety, security, and survival. Mm -hmm. But what's the concern area is if you continue to stay there, because if your need to be agreeable continues to grow, your mm -hmm. growth takes a toll. If you That's end up right. saying yes to everything, we'll not be able to make choices. And for that, the first step is, as you mentioned, notice, notice, and notice, because awareness creates possibilities. Matt, thank you so much for your time. An absolute pleasure uh, being with you, listening to you. If there's one thing that you would like to share with our audience as we're just coming to the conclusion of this episode, what would you like to tell them? Where should they begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Radical collaboration begins with each of us as individuals. It doesn't matter how draconian your organization is, how overly hierarchical, how bureaucratic it is. There is nothing stopping you from treating the people around you with trust, respect, and autonomy, and fairness, and esteem. There is nothing stopping you from doing that for the people around you, for creating opportunities for genuine connection and ultimately collaboration, right? And so don't think just because you are in an organization that doesn't seem radically collaborative today doesn't mean that you can't take that first step. You can. You can, and it will have an impact, at the very least, on those around you, a positive impact. And it'll have a positive impact on you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt, for being who you are. And I'm looking forward to our conversations in the future as well. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed being here.